We are ready to begin. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Project Chana, which is the Jewish Women's Power Hour. And every Tuesday, we get together, we learn, we strengthen ourselves with the three special mitzvahs of a woman, with Kashras, with Shabbos, with Taras Mishpacha. And we do all that, of course, with the goal to welcome Mashiach in our own homes and in the entire world. Um, I'm also just going to let you all know that you can stay for after the three speakers. We're going to do Tired to Feel Tzedakah together, learn a little Mashiach thought. So it's not over after the last speaker. Today's learning is dedicated as a schos for Shana Bas Chana. May she have a complete refuah shalema. And throughout the entire class, if, throughout the entire class, if you have any questions, you could just email projecthanapowerhour at gmail.com. That's projecthanapowerhour at gmail.com. It's also in the chat. You could just see it. If you listen, you have questions. And what's really beautiful about this is if you're listening to the class, whether live or in the recording, and you have a question, you could send an your question to that email address and a future speaker will address it. And now, without further ado, we're going to start with the first class in Taras and Mishpacha. And we are privileged to have Mrs. Sarah Razel Wagner, who's a longtime educator, certified college teacher, and she's going to continue on the topic of her Chakais. So thank you, Mrs. Wagner, and take it away. Okay, thank you so much. And welcome back, everybody. Tonight, we will be finishing this topic. So we have a few last halachis that we want to finish up. And then we also have some questions that came in over the weeks. And in Mitzvah Shem, we're going to address them now as well. Okay, so I want to begin actually just addressing a few questions that came up on last week's topic. Then we're going to finish the rest of the halachis. And then we're going to bring up the other questions from the past. So last week, we spoke all about the halachis that relate to mealtime and eating. And there were three specific points that came in as questions that I just wanted to clarify. So first of all, regarding the hecker. Someone was asking why it's okay to use a napkin holder or something like that. They thought that it can't be used. So I just want to clarify that when we discuss the different types of hacker, first we said it could be a food that isn't going to be eaten during the meal. And the second category was an object that you don't usually have that's noticeable that it's different. So the distinction between these two categories is if you're using a food that you're not going to eat, you can't use it during the meal because food is usually eaten. So if you want the food to be a hacker, it has to be something that clearly is designated as something that you're not going to be using. However, if it's an object that you're using, whether it's a napkin holder or a pitcher or a vase or whatever it is, the object is something which usually isn't on the table, or you said it's always on the table but in a different place. So the fact that that object is there, that itself is unusual. So yes, you can use the pitcher or the napkin holder as long as it's been there. And we said between the two of you, it is permissible to use. So that's the clarification about the hacker. The second point was, why is it okay for a wife to drink um, the Kiddush after her husband? Isn't it his leftovers? So I just want to clarify regarding the leftovers that we said that there's a difference between what a husband can do and what a wife can do. A wife is always allowed to eat and drink her husband's leftovers. So if he's finished eating, you can finish his drink, finish his food, no problem. It's the husband who isn't allowed to eat his wife's leftovers. And if he does, we learned last week what he needs to do, put it on a different plate or someone else eats in between or something like that. Okay, so it's not a problem. If he makes kiddish, you can then drink from his cup. Now, he can't drink it after you unless he pours it into a different cup or if someone else drinks it in between. But you're allowed to have his without an issue. So just as an example to sort of remember, if you are, um, you know, stuck in a car together, you're going somewhere and you have one bag of popcorn or one bag of chips or mango, whatever, your, you, you know, your thing, and a bottle of soda, water, whatever you drink, um, then either you put some on a napkin, right? You designate it or you pour it into a different cup. But if you're stuck and that's the only thing you have, and you have no cup to pour it into or no napkin to put, that's the only thing, one bag and one drink. Then if you're going to drink it, or eat it, your husband won't be able to have it because it's your leftovers. But if he has it first, then you're welcome to finish it. So that's how you would do it. Let him have whatever he wants, and you finish the rest. That's the clarification regarding the leftovers. And the third question that came in was regarding sending. We said that there's a one-way halacha that a husband is not allowed to send, definitely wine, a hush of drink, everything, anything except for water, according to Ketzi Dinetara. So the question was, how is it possible? May a husband buy a nice drink for his wife? Is that considered um, sending? And then also regarding Kiddush, isn't it, um, if he puts it down, is that like indirectly sending? Could you clarify the sending piece? Okay. So here's how it goes. The husband is not allowed to send this drink to his wife. If let's say you want to order a drink, if you're out together and you want to ask someone to bring a drink, your husband can say, can you please bring these drinks to the table? 
He's not saying bring it to the wife or bring it to the husband. He said, can you bring these drinks? So they could you bring some juice and load it to the table? They come, they say, who is this for? He can't say her. <laughs> he can't say, give it to my wife, but he could say, just put it down. Or the wife can say, I'll take that. Okay, so it could just be brought to the table. That's one option. Now, it does say in Tarak Halacha that, I don't want to get confusing here, but that the, the problem with sending, there, this is one of the opinions, that the problem with sending is specifically if the drink is the husband's or if it originates by the husband. But if someone else has a drink, it wouldn't be a problem for the husband to tell him to give it to his wife. It's only a problem if the husband is sending it, the drink is coming from him, whether it's his drink or it's starting off from him. So if your husband wants to order online a drink for you and someone's going to be getting this order and taking it to you and delivering it to you, that wouldn't be a problem based on this opinion. The problem is only if the if the drink originates by the husband. OK, so you could send for sure, bring it to the table. Everybody would agree that's fine because he's not directly sending it to you. And even um, according to this opinion, it would be OK if the sending doesn't begin by the husband. OK, I hope that that clarifies. I'm going to move ahead. There were two more halakhis that we're going to learn, and then we're going to clarify the rest of the questions. So we mentioned last week that there were three special activities. One is Mizika Sakais. We spoke about the pouring drinks last week, last week, and the two other ones are uh, making the bed and preparing water for washing. We're going to discuss this now. The only issue with these three activities is if it's done bifana. They're both, they're all two-way active um, issues. Okay, so a husband can't do it for the wife, the wife can't do it for the husband. But the only problem with these activities is if it's done in front of the spouse. Okay, so what we're going to start with the beds. It says that um, a husband or wife cannot spread the sheets of the bed in front of their spouse. Prepare the bed for sleep. It's not an issue, the tayreach part, the burn-in part. OK, the housekeeping part of this, like stuffing the pillows into the to the pillowcases or putting the blanket into the duvet cover, that's not an issue. But there's something endearing about preparing the bed for sleep. And there are some distinctions about what exactly this means. Some say if it's, you know, the morning, you're just making all the beds in the house, that's not a problem. You're just like tidying up. But if it's time to go to sleep and you want to make your husband's beds nice, let's say you got messed up a little bit, or you want to roll down the blanket for him to get inside, that would be problematic to do be fun of if he's in the room. If he's out of the room, and you want to make them nice, that's not an issue. But if he's in the room or if you're in the room for him to make the beds nice in order for you to get into it, that endearing piece, that's what would be problematic during Nida time, okay? When it comes to preparing water for washing, so it says that it's not permissible to prepare water, whether it's warm or whether it's cold, to wash the face, the hands, the feet. It used to be a big avoida, you know, to get the water. You weren't just turning on an easy faucet. So there was something also endearing about going and getting water and preparing it. Even now, if someone makes you a nice hot water bottle when you need or something, there's something, you know, nice about that. So what practically would this mean? Um, running water for a bath, um, preparing water in a, a tub, a shisel or something for someone to use. Again, the issue is only be fun of in front of the spouse. And it goes both ways, whether it's hot or cold water, preparing water for washing in front of one's spouse is not to be done. When it comes, some say that lidvar mitzvah is not an issue. So if you're preparing negobas, so you're preparing my machmein, it's not an issue because you're doing a firm mitzvah. Um, even if somebody would want to be careful, for sure, preparing negabas. If you're just preparing two neutral negabasas and putting it next to the bed, it's not a problem. And also, the only issue is bifana. So if your spouse isn't around and you're preparing the water, it's not an issue either. Okay? So that concludes the two other activities of making the bed and preparing water for washing. Okay, there. Um, I want to mention just one other halacha. We mentioned that um, when it comes to the need of time in general, of course, there's a connection between the couple and there's a closeness between the couple. However, the expression of any romantic feelings is what is paused, okay? And all the halakhis that we went through, so to give us the framework and give us the perspective of what kinds of things we can do during this time and which things can we still do, but in a more um, adjusted kind of way, except obviously the touch, which is, which is definitely at hold during this time. Um, learning is something which is encouraged. Learning tired together. Learning tired brings shalom. Always bring shalom in the world, bring shalom between people. So for sure, for a husband and wife to learn together is a beautiful thing to do and is encouraged to do. However, when it comes to need of time, we are careful not to learn about 
intimacy. Uh, we don't speak about intimacy during this time because these are discussions that bring to more intimate feelings between a couple and the whole framework, the, the feelings between the couples are ones which are close and connected but are, but are not intimate and are not romantic, okay? So I just wanted to mention that point as well. Okay. All the halakis that we learned these past few weeks are the same, whether it's the beginning of the Nida time or the end of the Nida time, even after the Hefzik Tara, which is called Bimei Libon, there's no distinction between the halachis and how they're kept the entire Nida time. From when a woman becomes Nida until she goes in the mikvah, they're the same. There are two interesting halachis that are often brought down in connection with these halachis, even though they're not harfaka halachis, but they are connected to a woman when she's Nida. So I just want to mention them. And these two points actually do have a distinction, be maybe one. And what are these? So it mentions in halacha, this is both for a woman and for a girl, that during the time of the flow, when a woman has her period or when a girl has a period, she doesn't go to a cemetery, to a beis hachayim. Um, if it's an important time, if it's the only time that she's in town, if it's a yard date, something special, then sometimes there's a leniency that the woman can go, she should stay a distance from the caver. Um, and the other thing is that when um, a woman, if a woman is in shul, she shouldn't gaze at the open sefer taira by hagba. A woman who has a flow shouldn't gaze at the taira. So these two halachas about the Beis HaChaim and about gazing at the sefer taira is specifically during the days of the flow. However, you may leap on, meaning after the Hasek Tara, it's not an issue to go to the, to the Beis HaChaim or to gaze at the Sefer Tara. It's specifically during the time of the flow, okay? All the other halachis that we learned are the same all the way through the needed time. Okay, so this concludes the learning of the Harchakais. If anyone has any other questions that I'm not going to be addressing tonight that you think of now or think of after this class, feel free to reach out, whether through Neshech Chabad or through Mechmed.org at any time. Okay, there are a few questions that came. Most of them connect to Harfakis, but one of them actually doesn't. But being that it came in, I want to address it anyway um, for whoever asked it. Okay, so the first question actually relates back to several classes ago. Somebody asked if I could please clarify the idea of putting the baby down on the bed. Why is this something that's allowed? Is it only for a baby or is, does it relate to other things as well? So regarding this, we explained that we can't touch each other or feel each other's movements, right? Or even touch a garment that is on the, the spouse. So here's how it works. If you are wearing clothing, right? Your spouse can't touch those garments either, even though he's not touching you. When you are under a blanket, if you're on a bed and the blanket is on top of you, the entire blanket becomes like an extension of you, okay? So just like you can't put something, uh, you know, on top of someone, on top of their clothing, take something out of their suit pocket or their purse or things like that. You also wouldn't be allowed to put something on or take something off of a blanket that is on your spouse during the needed time. So the so when we mentioned that putting a baby down or picking a baby up cannot be on a blanket if the spouse is underneath, that's the reason why. Because the blanket becomes like an extension of you. However, the permissible way to do this is if you move the blanket away and then it's the sheet which is under you they're not touching you. They're not moving enough that they're moving you through the movements of putting something onto the sheet and therefore it would be permissible. So if you wanna put the baby down or pick the baby up, it could easily be done from the actual sheet, the mattress, not from the blanket, okay? So I hope that that clarifies. It's not just the baby, but anything putting down on something. If you're sitting on a couch, you can put something onto the couch next to your spouse, right? Not moving the spouse through putting something on the couch. But if there's something over, if you're wearing a blanket on top of the couch, you want to put something onto that blanket because again, it's on you. It's an extension of you. Okay? So I hope that that clarified that question. The next question is actually not connected at all to me the time, but I tell my students all the time, all questions are welcome. If it's not negative to our specific class, we'll try to find the time to ask it. So I'm happy to address this question as well. The question was regarding um, Tvila, um, the, the custom of a woman titling during pregnancy in the ninth month of pregnancy. Somebody asked if I can clarify that minhag and if it's a Chabad custom. So it is not a Chabad custom. In the Sefer Eitzah Habris, it explains that in the ninth month of pregnancy, there's a school law for a woman to tevil in a mikvah. And through this, it will remove any negative effects of anything negative that was seen during the needed time or during the pregnancy months. Um, and this tefillah doesn't need any hakba, the, the laws of tefillah, preparing for tefillah and chatita are not relevant. It's just a minhag to tevil, almost similar to the way that a man will tevil, you know, for, for as a custom. So that's what it brings down there. However, there's a letter from the Rebbe 
the Rebbe writes, somebody was asking the Rebbe about doing this, and I believe there are other letters as well. The Rebbe says, I did not hear about this custom in Chabad, meaning it is not a Chabad custom to table in the ninth month of pregnancy. However, the Rebbe said, on the other hand, since your wife's family has this custom, it's understood, don't hold her back from doing it, meaning if she has this custom, she can um, she can do it, can move on with permission from the doctor. Okay, so to answer the question, there is such a custom. It is not a Chabad custom. If a family does have a custom, the Rebbe told them it would be okay as long as the doctor gives permission. Okay, so that's as far as that. Okay, the next question, the last question actually that came in is a little bit of a sensitive question. Um, but uh, usually when somebody asks a question, it's not the only person that has a question. Many people have this question, so I do want to mention it. Um, and if you did ask this question, I want to thank you for bringing it up. Obviously, through our learning, I want to try to encourage people, and we should all be motivated to do the halachas as best as we can. And this question helps us realize that for some people, that can be a real challenge. Somebody asked about how to deal with the discrepancy when there is a discrepancy between the husband and the wife's level of observance when it comes to her chakis. So it's very important to point out because when you learn the other parts of Taras HaMeshpacha, a woman is able to express her Yerushamayim and her care and her diuk in performing the mitzvah in a meticulous kind of way based on her level because she's going to be careful with doing the bidikas and doing everything on time and asking a shiloh when there's a rub from a rub anytime she has difficulty with something. It's all based on her own time and her own um, abilities. However, when it comes to her chakes, it's a little bit different because you're dependent on your spouse. And this is something that is done jointly. Um, so when there is a discrepancy, this can definitely cause a little bit of a, a challenge. Um, I think that it's a, good to have individual guidance for this question because the circumstances of the situation can definitely um, impact um, the solution as well. But I just want to point out a few things being that the question came in. So first of all, Obviously, the foundation of shalom bias is respect, and everybody's able to focus on the things about their spouse that they appreciate and the things that they're doing well and that they value. And through having shalom bias and having this respect and doing your best to communicate and share your own um, thoughts and feelings and listening to each other, you're able to really encourage each other to do to listen into the other one and to do the best you can to respect your spouse in this. Um, when it comes to areas in this mitzvah where halacha itself gives leeway, halacha will say there's room to be machmer or halacha will say there's room to be mekil, then it's important to listen to your spouse and see what they want and try to follow what your husband wants. Because if he wants to be extra careful or if he needs the leniency that's brought down in halacha, as long as halacha gives this space, it's important for you to be able to be on the same page with this, even if it's different than what you would have ordinarily done. However, when it comes to actual halacha, it's a little bit more tricky because you have a chiyo to do certain things. And therefore, the specific examples that were brought down were A, um, when it comes to passing things, and B, when it comes to him sitting on the bed and things like that. So sometimes it depends on the circumstances, but sometimes it's possible for um, a couple to sit down and learn together from a book like Family Purity, review the halacha, so it encourage us to learn it and just talk about it and see. Sometimes it's something very practical. You know, if you're out and you're going somewhere and you ask your husband to hold the baby and you left the stroller in the car and you're like going and you don't have anywhere to put the baby down, it could be very awkward. Sometimes it's a very practical thing that you can sort of preempt by planning. Um, so you could pay attention to what kinds of things it is that's coming up, and then you could avoid an unnecessary passing the baby when you have the stroller present, and it just makes it very smooth and easy. However, um, when it comes to other things, sometimes it's possible to have uh, like a family mashpia or somebody that you both respect to talk it over and see what could be done. And beyond that, if it's something which there still is a difference of opinion, it is valuable to um, speak to a rav yourself and explain the situation and see how the Rav can guide you as far as what you, your obligation is regarding keeping the halacha and what you can do to adjust to both have the respect and shalom bias with your husband as well in keeping the, as keeping the halacha in the best way you can. There are definitely many people, I've heard Sarah Carmeli speak about her story, who were 
you know, keeping Taras and Mishpacha to the best of their abilities, where the husbands were in very different places, and they have encouraged in a very strong way the Shalom bias and the respect, and that definitely enabled them to eventually keep the Alaches in a greater possible way in the future. So I want to thank you all for joining us for this part of the Halaches, for learning the Dine Herchaka. If I have a minute left to just quickly read a little piece from a Sikha, that about Taras and Mishpacha, that by observing the mitzvah of Nita Tara Tzvila, which was given to the Jewish woman, she thereby brings purity and holiness into family life. Through this mitzvah, we merits fine, healthy children, whole in body and soul, children who follow in the path of Tara and Mitzvah and bring true nachas and joy to their parents. And the schos of our learning, everybody should be benched with whatever they need. Banichai Mezayna, Kul Revichi, all the brachas shalom bayis, everything good. And thank you all for joining us and Hatzach Rabba moving forward. Thank you so much, Mrs. Wagner. That was so clear to the point, so easy to listen to. Very much appreciated. Um, now moving on to the next topic of Kashras. It's an honor to have Rabbi Bell, the Rev of Congregation Lubavitch in Montreal, and the Dayan of Basin in Montreal. Thank you so much, Rabbi Bell. Hey, thank you for the opportunity of addressing you. So I think i uh, share my screen over here. So... Yes, this is week eight. So I start off with just a few words from the Rebbe. So this is Behemshach, what I mentioned before about putting a pushka in the kitchen and attaching it to the wall and how before you cook and prepare the food and the effect it has on the Midas Teves of those in your family and those that are eating the food. And just to mention something more from this Seich and Tavshem Emtes in El and Sheikh Chabad. So he mentioned about that through attaching it to the wall, he said, like with a nail or something like it, you may make your house into a house of tzedakah. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy. You could just take a piece of paper, a piece of cardboard and and uh, fold it up. And you don't have to be a kunzmacher to be able to make your own pushka and just attach it to the wall. It's not a big deal that uh, attach it to the wall. And if you're traveling and you can't nail it into the wall, it's not your house. So just attach it in some way that it's uh, halakhically attached, something you wouldn't be able to detach on Shabbos, tape it or something of the sort. And then when you leave, you bring that pushka home with you, and then you can take that pushka and attach it to the wall. And then it was said of Frat that uh, through doing this, uh, that this is the place, which is the woman's place, the the kitchen, where she prepares the Mosin Gashmi for the whole family, and in the Zchus, of the Mitzvah Tzedakah. So this also adds in the Eberstitz Brachas and Parnas and everything good. And... Uh, Found the picture over here, as you see, doesn't have to be fancy. This is the Rebbe's kitchen, and you can see over here the green pushka attached to the wall over there, right next to the plug. Okay, so without further ado, we're going to finish this uh, list of things in the kitchen and the various halachic issues associated with them. So first, let's speak about serving utensils, cutlery, salt, and spices. So we have over here serving bowls. So here you have a salad bowl. So many people have a part of a salad bowl. So you don't usually have a part of a table. So what exactly is the status of this serving bowl? Do you need the fleshika salad bowl and a milchika salad bowl to put on the milchika table and the fleshika table? So the answer is not. Since everything is cold, as long as you're um, uh, making sure that the actual fleshik or milchik utensils are not being put directly in it. You have serving utensils, whatever the spoon that's being used to serve the salad, everything should be parved and everything should be kept separate. Now, I will mention, it's going to be relevant, we're going to be talking about salt shakers and things of the sort, that people's hands are not necessarily clean, especially, you could say, the younger uh, the younger generation and the children and the hands are full of grease. So what what is that? Um, how does that affect it? So since everything is... Uh, is, uh, is still cold. You just have to be careful that it shouldn't have, you know, mamish meat hanging on it. And uh, halakhically, that is considered to be mutter. So too, you don't have to, um, when it's cold, you can put it on a fleshuk counter, you can put it on a on a milchuk counter if it's par. We don't put fleshuk kalim on milchuk counters, even if they're cold. But on a parva serving bowl or something of the sort, um, we are lenient. So, too, you have in the middle different cooking utensils. So here you have uh, something which is used with hot food. You're flipping pancakes or eggs, whatever it happens to be, hamburgers. 
So they should be clearly identifiable which ones are milchik, which ones are fleshik. So the best is you have it like this. It's very, very visible. You know, and the, the Shulchan Aruch, it speaks about knives, about having separate knives and being careful about separate knives. We'll soon speak about um, the food that's cut with a knife, a fleshik knife, to use the milchik and vice versa. But um, it says that uh, the custom was... you. I'm not going to mention what the custom is because the custom is not like that anymore because the custom today is, is to label both of them, the milchik and the flesh, because then they would only label one. Everybody knew that if it had a chritz, you made a mark in it, so then you knew what, what it was. But today, the, both of them should be identified and they even sell little plastic or um, different sorts of identifying uh, trademarks. The best to have separate colors. You don't need that as long as it's easy to tell them apart and as i mentioned previous shurim you see on the right that knives are especially important you have special halakhic stringencies attached with them and that you have to be especially careful but all cutlery the, the milk cassette and the flesh cassette should be identifiable at first glance you shouldn't need to make a intensive examination to be able to tell which one is which it's too easy to get things mixed up Okay, salt and spices. So salt, the Shulchan Aruch says that you have to have separate salt for milk and separate for, for, for meat. Um, but they were not talking about salt shakers. They're talking about um, salt sellers and people would push it, take the meat and dip it right inside or take the cheese and dip it inside. So obviously you have such a situation. So you can have pieces of meat inside, and so obviously you have to have separate ones. But what about a salt shaker? The meat is not jumping through the little holes to get into the salt shaker. However, as we learned in our uh, introductory principles, we do have a concept of zaya, that the steam that's coming off of a food has the uh, status of the food itself. So you see on the left-hand side, if this would be rapidly boiling, which it I don't think it is. We don't see steam coming out, at least not from this picture. But if there would be a lot of steam coming out and it's going into the salt shaker, if it would be Yad Saleh Dispey, that was hot, as we discussed in previous occasions, what exactly the halachic definition of hot is. So then you would have an issue using that salt for something uh, milchik. So in general, it is for things that are so frequently used as a, as a salt shaker to have a separate one for the milchik and a separate one for the fleshik. And especially that people are using it a lot. So the issue I mentioned with the uh, cold parved bowl is much more uh, an issue when it comes to salt shakers, which are being used probably more often. And um, so therefore, it's proper to have a separate one for milk, except ones for fleshing. Now, does that actually, let's say somebody got it mixed up. Does it, uh, does it, uh, does it, does uh, it prohibit things? So um, in most cases, it's going to be far enough away or the food is not going to be so rapidly boiling that it's going to create a halachic problem. In the event that it did or that you frequently use it in such a manner, so then you have to be especially careful because it could make potentially uh, an issue. Although bidyevid, uh, I doubt it would because even though salt is not bottled b'shishim, um, if, but that would be only if the salt itself was prohibited. Salt is not bottle bashishim because it has a strong taste. Even if it's less than 160, if it'll give taste. But the salt does not become fleshic. The salt is carrying the taste of fleshic. Anyway, it's uh, beyond the scope of the shiurim to explain why, but you should nevertheless, if it happens and it got hot and you got it mixed up and you're frequently doing so, you definitely should ask a shayla. On the right-hand side is another etza, what you could do to do it just with your uh, with your hands. Now, when it comes to other spices, you know, people sometimes have a lot of different uh, jars of spices. You know, people that have, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 different types of spices. So does the 10, 20, 30 need to come 20, 40, uh, 60? You need two sets for milk and fleshik. So the, the answer is no, you don't need separate. You don't need even, technically speaking, for salt, as long as you're careful that it shouldn't get... Uh, uh, hot steam coming up into it. So if you're not sure, so then you could always put the spices in your hand and then put it inside or else just hold it high enough above the food if it's actively hot and giving off steam that it shouldn't get mixed up. But there's no halacha that you must have separate. Um, but it is a teva and it's 
you know, might be more convenient, depends on how much you use them and whether when you're putting in the spices, you know, do you wait till it's all heated up and rapidly boiling or you put it in the beginning when that's not an issue. Okay, next. I put this in a separate category, blender, grater, food processor. So um, although in general, these are being used cold, sometimes they are used hot. And then it's a, it's, a, it's a different category of Shaila. But let's say when it's being used cold, what's unique about these in, in comparison with other cold um, preparation um, kalim or, or serving bowls or things of this nature, that these have blades. And since they have blades, they have the same halachic status as a knife. So therefore, if you're going to be using um, any of these with a dover kharif, as we mentioned earlier, that sharp things have the power to convey taste, even though they are um, they're cold. So then it could be a potential issue with some of these kalim. So if let's take a let's take a, a food processor. So let's person has a, a, a fleshka food processor, let's say. How did it become a fleshic of a food process? Who says it's fleshic in the first place? So if you wash it with the fleshic, so then it's fleshic and they clip if it was used with hot water, if it was together with meat and there was taste being absorbed. If you ever used it for hot meat, which I'm not sure how common that is, but if that was the case, then it's really fleshic. But it could be the person is just really calling it fleshic it's not so fleshic. And the reason I'm mentioning this because when things... If and when things get mixed up, so it's important to keep that in mind. When you have people have milchik and knives, and the question is, a milchik and knife, how milchik is the milchik and knife? You have a milchik and grater. Okay, I don't know if people are using manual uh, graters anymore. Rabbi Handel Oliver Shalom had a Verchidish din regarding Hilcha Shabbos, and not learning Hilcha Shabbos here. We'll leave that for Rabbi Braun. But uh, it, it speaks in Shulchan Aruch about a ribizen, about a manual grater. So this was he passed away many years ago, but he said even then he said, "Where nuts the ribeisen hind? Who today uses a ribeisen? People are using uh, electronic, uh, the, 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 using other gadgets to take care of it. But let's say a blender or something of the sort. If it was if it really absorbed the taste of 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 cheese or something dairy, so then it would become really dairy. But let's say you have a grater or you have a, a cheese knife. So if we used to cut a hot pizza, so then it's going to absorb the taste." But otherwise, how milchik it is, so we it, it, it's milchik, you washed it with hot water, with the milchiks together. Um, so then it, all of these things should be treated milchik. The reason I'm mentioning it was not to, that you should make a kula and say, oh, you don't need a separate milchik and fleshik. You do. Okay, unless you have parv. And if it's parv, then you're making, you're grinding up your potatoes and you're making a parv a kugel and you can serve it however you want as long as you don't put in any schmaltz. But the reason I'm mentioning it is sometimes that after the fact, when something got mixed up, and you say, I have a milchik uh, such and such. So it's good to keep in mind how milchik is it. It's also, as we'll be learning soon, it's very important. I mentioned on a number of occasions that you sh if you ever have to ask a shaila, you should do so as soon as possible, because it is important for the Rav to know when the last time a particular uh, utensil was used for milchik, fleshik, or whatever it was used for, how hot it was, when was the last time it was used, and that's uh, going to be m much more difficult to remember if it was later on. But anything which has a blade will have the same uh, status, basically, as a knife, and therefore, especially when we're dealing with the, uh, things which are sharp, so then it will have the power to convey taste, even though things are still cold. Okay. should mention uh, there's a somewhat of a controversy. I mean, that, uh, that forks are not considered in the same category as a knife, but they, I've noticed some modern-day authorities have found a new humor with that, and so you, your, your Rav might uh, keep that humor. So I'm just mentioning that in the same category, according to some opinions of a knife. Okay. Now, before getting down to the nitty gritty, the nitty gritty, what I mean, the more the common cases, I started writing down cases of shilas I received during the week. You know, somebody cooked some pasta in a flesh of pot, and then somebody else put it in the milk of a bowl and put cheese on it. 
and all sorts of variations upon a theme, all these sort of issues. These are very, very commonplace occurrences, and we're going to be speaking about those next. However, in order to understand them properly, we need two more halachic concepts. The first one is the concept of a ben yeme. We discussed that before. I put in, in parentheses a newborn. You say a newborn baby is a tinik ben yeme. So it doesn't mean that the baby had a 24-hour birthday. It's the opposite. Before it, a newborn is called a tinik ben yeme. From the time it's born until it's 24 hours old, it's still called a ben yeme. Ain't a ben yeme is it's more than 24 hours. When we're talking about taste, so if a pot was used for meat, for example, so after... Uh, 24 hours after it was used for cooking meat, within that 24-hour period, it's a ben yeme, and the taste has a different status, completely different status than when it's after 24 hours. A completely different world. We're also going to be learning about not or not, but I put that in the background because I don't know if we're going to get to it today. We probably won't. But I'm going to just give a demonstration just to explain because people don't uh, always have it clear this difference between what's the difference between before 24 hours and after 24 hours. So the next couple of slides is going to teach that. So it's once you understand it, you'll it's e more it, it's it's easier to keep alert to what's going on in your kitchen. Now, obviously, lechatchila as a manner of how to run a proper Jewish kitchen, you don't mix things up. But nobody's doing this on purpose. Um, but but the evidence if it already happened, so it's important to know when things were being used. So to explain what's the difference between a ben yeme and not a ben yeme, so we're going to go like this. Okay, this is a kosher pot. Okay, and it, it's a green, is it, it was parv, I don't know, it's uh, got some food in it, it's got some soup in it, whatever it's... And along comes a trefa spoon, and somebody takes a trefa spoon and puts, let's say it's a pot of boiling water. Somebody takes a trefa spoon and puts it in the pot of boiling water. What happens to the water? And what happens to the pot? So we say, now the pot is also treif, and the water is also treif. We used to have a kosher pot with kosher water. We put in a treif spoon into it. Now we have a treif pot. We have a treif water, and the treif water makes the pot treif also. So we have a whole bunch of treif things over here. Fine. Okay, so that's case number one. Clear. Case number two. The other way around. It's not a, it's not a kosher pot with a treif spoon. It's a trefa pot with a kosher spoon. What happens? Here we have a trefa pot with trefa water. If you like, it could be the pot from the previous slide, if you prefer that, but it doesn't have to be. Anyway, you take a, now a kosher spoon, and you put a kosher spoon in the trefa pot. What happens now to the kosher, the, the kosher spoon? The kosher spoon is now a trefa spoon. Okay. So now, what happens if you take this trefa spoon and you put it in a kosher pot? So we know from the last slide what happens when you take a kosher a trefa spoon and you put it into a kosher pot, then you're going to end up with a trefa pot. Correct? Okay. Just keep in mind this last picture over here. You got a kosher pot, a trefa spoon goes into the trefa pot, in the kosher pot. What happens? The trefa spoon takes the kosher pot and makes a trefa. Correct? Everybody understands that? We don't use trefa spoons in our kitchen with our kosher pots. Correct? Okay, fine. Now we got a trefa spoon. Let's say that the spoon became trefa by accident. You want to kosher it. How do you kosher a spoon? What do you do with a kashrun? You have let's just go back here. You have now a trefa spoon. How do you kasha a trefa spoon? You take a trefa spoon and you put it in boiling water, right? The boiling water you're gonna make in a kosher pot or a trefa pot? <laughs> Obviously, you're not gonna put it in a trefa pot, you're gonna put it in a kosher pot. So when you cash it a trefa spoon, you're gonna have to boil up water in a kosher pot. And then put it inside the kosher pot. And then at the kosher pot is going to take the trefa spoon and make it a kosher spoon. Yeah, but didn't we just say that when you take a trefa spoon and you put it in a kosher pot, what happens? What happens? It makes the pot today. So what's going on over here? We just said that when you take the trefa spoon, you put it in the kosher pot and the boiling water, then it makes the water in the pot today. Now we're telling me, okay, now you got a trefa spoon. So how are you going to kosher? You can put it in the boiling water in a kosher pot. We just said that makes it the pot today, not the spoon kosher. Okay, so... I imagine everybody understands the problem. It's an obvious problem. The difference is whether the spoon is a ben yeme or not a ben yeme. If the spoon is a ben yeme, that it was used for treif in the last 24 hours, it will make the pot treif. However, if the spoon was not a ben yeme, and you put it in the pot, the pot will make the spoon kosher. 
Okay, I'm talking about today from Kosher, and I thought I would have more time, but I see I ran out of time already. But I wanted to get to, I'll just, uh, you know, give you the, the, the outline. This same principle, the general principle about whether something was used in the last 24 hours applies to milk and meat as well. However, um, it's much more lenient, and that's where we're going to need the second principle that I put on the slide. But the most common case here is somebody cooked pasta in a parva pot, Okay, and then they put a fleshika spoon into the parva pot. Or vice versa, it could be a fleshika pot and they use the parva spoon, whatever the case is. Let's say it was a parva, the parva pasta, a person put in a fleshika spoon. Okay, now the person took that pasta and he put it on a plate. And now they want to put cheese on it. So now what happens? We have some taste of the meat that went into this water and into the pasta. And now the taste has been somewhat diluted. And that concept is called not by not. We're going to learn some about that. We're not going to go into the details of it. But to, to what point do you have to worry about crossover? Will it make the food treif? Will it make the kalim treif? We're going to give some examples. But that we're going to have to leave for next week. Thank you very much, Rabbi Bell. Loved all the pictures. So clear. Thank you for the full presentation. Um, now we're going to go on to the next mitzvah, the mitzvah of Shabbos. And we have the privilege here from Rabbi Brian, the Mara de Asper of Crown Heights. Is Rabbi Brian pinned? I still see Rabbi Bell. I'm here. Do you hear me? Oh, yes, now. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's go straight into it. Just before, um, First of all, I have to say this uh, just before we start. I'm inspired every single week. Um, again, when I see so many women, the ones that I could see, is the amount of participants that we see here, and I'm sure there's many others that listen to it afterwards. It's really inspirational, and it's an amazing thing to take an hour off your time and to become proficient in the halachas that you need to know, which is an amazing thing. And if we're talking about Hilkha Shabbos specifically, I should mention that the al Rebbe tells us that every single Shabbos we should learn the halachas of Shabbos. It's an important thing to do every Shabbos. And the Sefer Yaras Dvasha, the Bienes and Eibshit says that if we don't learn Hilkha Shabbos, it's impossible to keep Shabbos. So we're still doing the halachas of Kiddush, it's taken us a bit longer, but it's important before we keep the halachas of Shabbos first to make it to become Shabbos, and that's when we make Kiddush. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna first going to follow up on a couple of questions that came in, and then go to this week's shir. So hopefully we can do the questions very quickly. There were questions that are not related to the subject that we're learning about. So with respect to all those who submitted those questions, if it's not related to the topic of Kiddush, I'm not, I won't deal with it because I want to focus on the subject. And there are questions that will come up either later today tonight or next week. So we'll wait for those. There was a question. I'm going to read the question exactly how it came in. I understand that in order to be Yitzhah, the mitzvah of Kiddush, the Kiddush has to be Bamakim Suda, which is something we spoke about the week before. You can only fulfill the mitzvah of Kiddush if you have a meal afterwards. And we spoke about various options for that meal. That could be bread, that could be mezoinus, could even be another cup of wine, etc. So this person asked, however, if I know I'm going to be hearing Kiddush later on, and that later Kiddush will be Bamakim Suda, would it be I'm assuming you're supposed to say, would it be okay? So the answer to that question is, if you're going to be hearing Kiddush later on, and that Kiddush will be Bamakam Suda, that will be Kiddush. And the Kiddush you're hearing now will not be Kiddush. So the Kiddush that you're doing now is a meaningless Kiddush, and if you're going to be eating now, you're going to be eating before Kiddush. So that's straightforward the way it is. You cannot have the mitzvah of Kiddush unless it follows a Suda, bread, mezoinus, cup of wine, etc. Next question, is there a specific time for when we should not eat or drink before Abdullah? Yes, from sunset. From sunset, Shabbos afternoon, it's considered before Havdali can eat or drink unless you're in the middle of a meal. Next question. We learned that we dive in Mincha before Lich Benchen. You're supposed to always dive in Mincha before you bench Lich for Shabbos. The question was, it's about 10 minutes before the time to bench Lich, and I didn't yet dive in Mincha. What's better? Should I make a Tanai, a stipulation, when I bench Lich that I'm not accepting Shabbos with my Lich Benchen that I could do Mincha afterwards? Or should I just dive in Mincha first and then light candles? So I need to clarify this question. Mincha itself shouldn't take you that long. If you have 10 minutes to light candles, the candle lighting time, Mincha shouldn't even take 10 minutes. Unless you're doing the full-on Mincha with Pas Chaydu and Pas Chaliyo and Karbanas and, Hun, and Aleinu and who knows what. So it's definitely important to take care of your Shemun and do that first. Because really you're supposed to do Mincha before candle lighting. And if you manage us to do Shemun the rest of the stuff, you'll add later on. If we're really getting pressed for time, for some reason, Yeshua Nesra takes 10 minutes, and Kala Kavadfa takes you 10 minutes. That's amazing. On a Friday afternoon, to be able to spend 10 minutes on a Mincha Yeshua Nesra, then and you're stuck, and you won't be able to light candles on time. And then you should light candles on time. You should not delay candle lighting time. 
And then you should make that stipulation and have a mincha afterwards. Again, I'll just um, repeat again what we spoke in previous classes, that we ordinarily, a woman is not supposed to make a stipulation when she lights candles, she's not accepting Shabbos unless there's a serious need. But we did mention Davini Mincha is a very serious need. If because of that she won't be able to have a mincha because she accepted Shabbos, she can make that stipulation. And two other questions. When a woman or girl makes Avdal, does she do Ma'ayra Ha'ish? So there's a bit of disagreement about that, but the accepted practice is that women do make Ma'ayra Ha'ish too. They have the same halacha like men in terms of making a bracha on the fire. However, when they're hearing Kiddush from, uh, sorry, not Kiddush, Havdalah, from someone else, so why do they have to make the bracha? They could just hear the bracha and say, I mean, instead of making their own bracha. But when they're making their own havdala, certainly they should make a bracha on the fire. There is, however, a custom, which is particularly in Chabad, but some other circles have it also, that although the women are part of the mitzvah of Moira Eish, but they don't look at their nails during havdala, and there's a spiritual explanation for that, which has to do with the sin of Eitz Hadas, which we're not going to go through that right now. So it is such a custom, but in terms of making the bracha of Moira Eish, yes, that bracha applies to them, but like I said, if you're going to be hearing havdala anyhow, so why do you have to go and just make the bracha when there are those that say the woman should make the bracha? And final, last question, and then we'll move on to this week's shir. What is the status of having to say Atachan Antanu, a baracha mavdul, ben Kodesh al-Khabi for doing malacha? I'm not sure the meaning of the question, what is the status? But <laughs> there's something to make clear. Um, we didn't talk about this at all, but it's important before a woman does work, a woman or man does work on Matzah Shabbos, anything that you now do on Shabbos, so you, you need to do either make Abdullah, or David Meir ben Seyat Chanantanu, or as a minimum, say the words, Baruch HaMavdu ben Kedush Lachav. So that's, yeah, either one is fine. Baruch HaMavdu, Ad Chanantanu, Ad Chanantanu in Meir, or even Ad Chanantanu out of Meir, if you need to make some sort of verbal Havdal, even though not on a cup. In order to be able to eat or drink, you need to do the Havdal on the cup of wine. And that's in terms of the questions. Let's go straight into what we're supposed to be talking about. We do have 14 minutes, and we'll try to cover as much as we can cover. We call it Power Hour for a good reason. Okay, so this week's share, I want to talk about what we make Kiddush and Abdullah on. What beverage? So ideally, we make on wine. Now, there's two types of wine. In Allah, we have a concept called Yain Migitoy, wine the way it came out from the press, which means wine which didn't ferment it and didn't turn into wine. And in modern lingo, we call it grape juice. The reason I'm saying modern lingo, because grape juice is not exactly the same as wine the way it came straight, straight, straight out of the press. Because grape juice has preservatives added to it and a bunch of other tazarai. And your gra- the, the grapes that were squeezed could, in theory, turn into wine. But the grape juice that you buy in the store, it's difficult. It, that happens occasionally, too, but it's difficult to see it turning into wine at some stage. So according to halacha, freshly squeezed gr- juice from grapes is considered wine. It's not preferred wine. It's called, it has a special name. It's called yayin chadosh, fresh wine. Sometimes it's called tiroish. Another nickname for freshly squeezed grape juice. Another name is Yain Mik Gitus, wine straight from the press. So the Gemara tells us that you let us squeeze a cluster of grapes and go make it at Kiddush. Obviously, you can't squeeze it on Shabbos. You mean squeeze it right before Shabbos and then you can make Kiddush on Shabbos. That's the halacha. It's perfectly fine. However, there's a mitzvah and a mufkar, a preferred mitzvah, and we always have a hadr mitzvah. The preferred way of doing the mitzvah is what we call Yain Yashan. Wine that has aged. And especially in the time of Chazal, it was 40 days it would take for the wine to age and to ferment properly. So some want to argue that our grape juice is worse off and we can't even make Kiddush and Avdol on our grape juice, but that's not the accepted opinion. The accepted opinion is that our grape juice is also considered kosher for Kiddush and Avdol. It's still not the ideal way of doing a mitzvah. And we all know the famous story, or some of us know the famous story, that the Rebbe, when the Rebbe had a heart attack, Shemini had said us by Hakafis, and the doctors said that the Rebbe is probably missing sugar, and they wanted the Rebbe to eat and to drink, and the Rebbe didn't want to do anything before, right after the heart attack, before he makes Kiddush. So they offered the Rebbe to make Kiddush on grape juice, and the Rebbe said, Kiddush mach So even though the Rebbe needed sugar in his blood, and wine wasn't the best thing for him, no, he wasn't going to forgo, and it was right after a heart attack, um, the Rebbe was not going to forgo on this hitter of making Kiddush on Wine that, but like I said, it's a mitzvah. Now, what there is kosher to use grape juice. Now, there is in wine there are two types of wine. We have wine called yain lavan versus yain adon, white wine versus red wine. 
And there is a whole argument, and there's a lot of legitimacy to this argument, that this whole idea of white wine and red wine doesn't apply to today's wine. All our wine is considered red wine, even the one that's the so-called white wine is really red wine. The white wine that the place can talk about was really, really white, different than today's wine. According to Halacha, there is a minority opinion that says red wine is better. We don't follow that opinion. This minority opinion says that white wine is not even kosher. We don't follow that opinion, and it doesn't have to be red wine. The only time we 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 go out of a way to try to use red wine is Pesach. Pesach is a special thing to, to commemorate the blood and uh, many other things. There's a special idiom to use red wine. On Shabbos, on a regular Shabbos, Kiddush Abdullah, white wine or red wine is better. There's no Indian to that you take the red wine unless it's better than the white wine. So we have a general rule. We're supposed to take Yain Meshubach, a better type of wine, a better quality wine. It also should be more tasty for you but that's not what Mashubach means. Mashubach means it's better quality. So we should try to make something which is better quality. There's another thing about not using yain mevushal. There's an minority opinion that says that any wine which wasn't kosher to use to pour onto the Mizbech is not kosher for Kiddush. So any wine which is mevushal, and you'll look at your wine, some say mevushal, some not say mevushal, or has no sugar. Well, they talk about honey, but sugar is very similar to honey. That's not kosher for the Mizbech. Now, again, we don't pass like that, but what we do hold is that if you have two equal wines, you have two wines, mavushal and not mavushal, and they're both equal in quality, obviously you're better off taking the not mavushal. And that's where you'll find a lot of people, you'll go to people's homes, some people are very particular to take not mavushal wine. And other people will dafka take the mavushal wine. The reason why some people take the mavushal wine because when it comes to issues with goyim handling the wine, once it's mavushal, there's no problem of going and handling the wine, looking at the wine, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But the not mavushal is really a problem. So if you're having not from people, and you don't even know who's Jewish and who's not Jewish, or all that kind of stuff, it's not a good idea to be holy and use the non mavushal wine. In fact, the Rebbe would give sometimes special, but after the Rebbe told certain people that before you go through the border, cook the wine. Put it on top, pot, literally cook it. Which is another whole discussion whether today's pasteurization is really mavushal or not mavushal and touch every single topic. So, there is that advantage of not mavushal, but on the other hand, it has its problems. So, some people get the mavushal, and they don't have any problems. And some people get the not mavushal, they make sure to hide it very well, and the cleaning lady should never see it. What's this issue of the cleaning lady not seeing the wine? So, let's talk about that. And there's a lot of misconceptions, a lot of myths and misconceptions about this topic. The halach is, wine which was poured to is treif. That's called Yain Nesach. That's in the Torah. There's something else called Stam Yenam, which is rabbinic rule, which means that people often use the wrong terms. That gets me personally. I can't stand when people use the term Yain Nesach, it means Port Favre when it's not really Yain Nesach. Stam Yenam means the typical wine which a guy has, which a guy handled. And there's a bunch of rules what's considered handled the wine. If you poured the wine, if, so for example, a goy takes a, if a wine has a cover on it, it's not called handled by a goy. So there's a whole bunch of rules about that. There's no halacha that a goy is not going to see wine. No such thing. You won't find it anywhere in Shulchan Aruch and any Paiskin. It's not halacha. There is, however, a chumrah which is found in certain svarim, not, not halacha, that certain chassidim and amshemais, the pious individuals had this extreme approach, and they were machmer about what they call today rias goy or rias akum. A guy looked at it, you never know when the guy look at something in their mind, go, they have all kind of trafe ideas in their mind. I don't want to touch wine that a guy looked at it. But that's not found in the Shulchan Aruch. It's not found in all the places around the Shulchan Aruch. And if you'll go to the store, to the wine store, it's important that you know this, and you'll buy wine with a beautiful, top, top, top quality hechter, it will be wine that in the factory, guy looked at that wine. Very, very likely. Because a lot of hechterim are not particular about that. Finish Shadam R, and it means I don't mean ultra orthodox Shadam, I mean Chasidisha, that could people from a Chasidisha background. So, for example, the Eid Acharedis in Echisol, the top actions, it's not an issue for them. So, in Chabad, we're very particular about that. For those who remember, the Rebbe's Fabrain, the Rebbe's wine was always in a paper bag. And the Rebbe always personally handled his wine, he didn't give it over to anybody else. It's one thing that the Rebbe handled himself and let other people be part of that. So Chassidim are very particular about that, and therefore we don't want going to see our wine, which is a problem only if it is not Mavushal. If it's Mavushal, then we're not really concerned about that. So again, those who are worried and people are going to see the wine, it's very hard to, you know, people come, take the wine, and 
some people are worried about going seeing it. Often the problem with the cleaning ladies, they don't only see and they actually handle it. They'll take the wine, they'll pour it, they'll do this, they'll do that. So that's, of course, that will be an advantage to use the bushel. Now this chumrah of not having a go see the wine generally is accepted by chassidim. They only makhmer for kiddush, for havdalah, for kashal bracha, but it's not for the wine that you're pouring into your meat. People are usually not makhmer about that. So I just want to put it out there. So we have yain nesach, wine which is poor for Vedazara, stam yainam, the typical wine that a guy handled, which is a problem with Rabbanon. And then there's a chassidish thing called Riyas Goy. Okay. Now let's go to the next thing, is, and that is in terms we spoke a lot about wine, but the other alternatives that we use for Kiddush. The other alternatives, I'm actually holding one of my wine in my wine, in my hand, a cup of coffee. The other alternatives are something called Hamar Medina, the local beverage, the local Hashra beverage. And the other term is bread. Two other choices for the item on which to make Kiddush or Havdalah. So with Havdalah, there's no such thing as making Havdalah and bread. Get it out of your mind. Havdalah and bread don't go together. Because Kiddush is linked with bread. You make Kiddush b'makam su. The Kiddush has to do with your meal. Havdalah, it's not a, you don't have to have a meal after Havdalah. So Havdalah has no association with bread. And you make Havdalah on challah, it's not Havdalah. So Havdalah only has the option of wine or local beverage. This condition is what's considered a local beverage. We have stories of our Abeim. Particularly on the night of their Hestalkus, the Alter Rebbe was Nestalik on a Matzah Shabbos, and he made Abdullah on coffee. The Rebbe Rashab was Nestalik on a Matzah Shabbos, and he made Abdullah on coffee. We actually have such stories of our Rebbe. Um, in terms of halacha, of making, let's go back now to the actual halacha. There's four different opinions, and I want to mention these four different opinions. I, I don't like confusing people, but I think it's important to get things, <laughs> get the background to understand the halacha. And we are, we take into account the various different opinions. There's one opinion that says there's no such thing as bread or local beverage. It's only wine. Nothing else goes. Opinion A. Opinion 2 says, opinion B, wine is fine, bread is fine, but there's no such thing as a local beverage. Opinion C says, you need to have a cup. Wine or local beverage, but not bread. And opinion D says, no. You could use a local beverage. It's not a hit or mitzvah. It's not ideal. Of course, the chatrili should use wine. But there's such a thing called a local beverage or bread. Okay, now that I told you a bunch of opinions, Rabbi, you confused us. What do we do? So the answer is as follows. Mitzvah and Amuvcher, the preferred way of doing a mitzvah is always to use wine. And when I say wine, I mean grape juice also, although grape juice is one step below wine. Right? So you order priority would be wine, and right under that would be grape juice. What if a person lives in a place where there's no wine? And the equivalent of that, what a, what a person who's not allowed to have wine. It's the same idea as living in a place where there's no wine. Almost the same. So the al makes a very interesting compromise. And he says the difference between the night and the day. By night, bread is preferred. By day, local beverage is preferred. And that's why you find a lot of people making Kiddush HaMashka, Shabbos Day. You don't find such a thing usually Friday night. Also because Shabbos Day, there's more time to make Kiddush HaMashka. And Friday night, the rabbits in the Balabas is not going to be very impressed. <laughs> but there's also a halachic aspect. And the reason is, because Shabbos Day, if you can make Kiddush on bread, then it doesn't look like you made Kiddush. You always make a bracha on bread in the beginning of the meal. There's no special Kiddush Shabbos Day. All the stuff that we say before Kiddush is just added stuff later. It's not part of actual Kiddush. So all you can say, Where's the Kiddush over here? By night, you're giving a whole Yom HaShishri with Hashem Kiddush It looks like a whole beautiful fancy Kiddush. So by day, by night, we don't want to use, by day, we don't want to use bread. But if there is wine in town, of course, you should you should be concerned with the opinion that says bread doesn't count, and you shouldn't use bread, you should always use wine. But al never mentions that in our countries, wine is expensive, and some people started using local beverages by day, specifically by day, and therefore there's room for leniency, because by, what they're doing by day is they're making Kiddush on a local beverage, then they're eating bread, so they're covering almost all the bases, because they're having both bread, and a local beverage, and the wine is expensive, and it's by day, and it's not by night, and by, by day is not that important. So it became this thing to be more lenient Shabbos day to make on the local beverage. And so, some people are very machmed. They want to do the mitzvah and muskar. The Rebbe would always make Kiddush on wine. By day and by night. No such thing as making Kiddush on mashka. And specifically when we're talking about making Kiddush on mashka, I should mention that the Rebbe spoke very strongly against people. Overdosing is the wrong word. But overconsuming, I should say, mashka. And the Rebbe put limitations in it. And when he made those limitations, he said part of the limitation is I only want you to make Kiddush either on wine or bread and not on mashka. Mashka is out of the equation. 
And even though a piece of chalana, there's room for something like that, it is a local beverage. So the Rebbe said, but if you'll take, if you'll work on yourself to make sure that mashke becomes a dover hamos, becomes something despisable, then it's not a precious. So it's not a chashu, it's not a chashu, you can't make it on it. That's the way the Rebbe said. And the Rebbe wrote sharp letters. I was shocked to hear that people are making Kiddush on Mashka. There were occasionally with the Rebbe allowed it, but generally the Rebbe was against it. The Rebbe wrote a letter to Farah Chabad, to Rabbi Gorel, who recently publicized that she gave him a list of all the people that are not listening to the rule and they're making Kiddush on Mashka. So the Rebbe did not like that. Talking about Kiddush on Chala, I will mention, and we'll wrap up with this, because we are running a bit late. Um, I'm just going to mention two very interesting things. There's a sta- saying in the name of the Rabbeim that they did not like the idea of making Kiddush Afameser, Kiddush on a knife. And there's a few contradictions about that. Because the Rebbe Rashab, there was a time in Astav, there was no wine, and he made Kiddush on Chala. And he made fun of himself. He said, I'm a Pashti, so I make Kiddush on Chala. But on the other hand, he didn't let Yan Kalando, he said, if he can't make Kiddush on Chala, he has to use beer. One time he had fever, and the Rebbe said, said, if he has fever, maybe the Rebbe will let him make not to use, drink beer. The Rebbe Mamish with difficulty allowed him to make a challah. So there's certain people he didn't let, he himself made a challah, didn't let them. When the Rebbe Shabbos, the week when, the, the week when he passed away, he passed away in Matzah Shabbos, we said, that Friday night, it was a very interesting description of what happened when he passed away. Mamish, the night before he passed away, he was very, very not well. And the Rebbe said, asked, maybe I should give you a bit of coffee. And she, he's, and she gave him a bit of coffee in a, a jar, and he said, no. She still took a spoon to his mouth, gave him coffee. And he didn't want, he didn't want to drink before Kiddush. His medicine he took with a bit of water, but he wasn't going to take the coffee. Then there was a person that was being Meshamash, the, the Rebbe Rashab, and he sat in a chair in a nearby room, he fell asleep. His name was Yaakov Isaac, and he heard the Rebbe Rashab saying, Yaakov Isaac, the Rebbe, like I said, the Rebbe was very, very, Mamash, the day before it was nostalgic. So he said, Vas Rebbe, the Rebbe said Kiddush. So he asked the Rebbe, he knew that obviously the Rebbe Rashab can't have wine right now, it's out of the equation. He said, Vas the Rebbe Machi Kiddush, Kava other tea, coffee or tea. So he said, a kazai is chala. So he asked the doctor. The doctor says he could take a dry kazai of chala, soak it in coffee, and he could give it to him. So he came back to the Rebbe Rashab and he said, can we have, take the chala, soak it in coffee? He said, yeah. And then the Rebbe Rashab in the state said, Rufti, call her. So he asked, who are you talking about? So the Rebbe Rashab said, the Balabasta, call my wife. The Rebbe was up a whole week. She was up every single night looking after the Rebbe Rashab. So she was, fell asleep at that time. So Yaakov Isaac told the Rebbe Shav she's sleeping already. So the Rebbe Shav said, Zit Shinge heard Kiddush? Did she at least hear Kiddush? So he said, yeah. So the Rebbe Shav can give me the Kiddush. And they made Kiddush on Kala. The last Friday night of the Rebbe Shav. There were times that Friedrich Rebbe says that Chassidim, there was such a, they were so against Mashka, they didn't even let them make Kiddush on wine. Even wine. They wanted to make a, a strong rule and they only used Kala. So we have some lessons that are that were against this idea of challah, but generally speaking, according to Allah, like we said, by night, you're stuck. We would make a challah. By day, we would make another beverage. We have to stop right here. Thank you very much, Rabbi Ibrahim. Very informative and interesting. So just to share a short Inyan and Mashiach thought, um, that I find very empowering is that when you look at how Hashem created the world, Hashem created animals in pairs. And when it came to Adam Arisha himself, he was created Yechidi, he was created alone. And the reason specifically is because Hashem wanted us to know that every single person that's listening to this now and every single person that you interact with, you, the entire world is depending on you individually, you're the one who can bring Mashiach, you're the one who could make a difference, do that one thing that could tip the scale. And man was specifically empowered, man and woman. But as the ultimate in creation, we were specifically empowered on our own to each feel like the world needs us, Hashem needs us, and in order for Mashiach to come, I need to be doing my maximum um, in order to make it happen. So that's a Mashiach thought. Um, if you have a pushka or a coin near you, you can give to Daka. I actually intended to bring down my pushka and I forgot, so I don't have it with me. I'm going to a next shop upstairs and give some Daka. And also, uh, it was very interesting how Rebel was describing that even when you travel and everywhere you go, you should make sure there's a pushka attached to the wall. I never thought of it. 
kind of summer in the bungalow. I'm thinking tzedakah. It's just an interesting thing to think about. The Rebbe really wanted our gosh mystical food to be connected to tzedakah. Um, and let's say the Rebbe's capital. Can we have it on the screen? I'm sure all of us, as much as we came onto this call and we lived our life today the way we intended to live our life, we still feel broken and want to do something baruchnius for the situation in Eretz Yisrael, for our brothers and sisters in Eretz Yisrael. And so in the memory of those that pass and the sus of those that are fighting and for the safety of Eretz Yisrael, let's say Kapetzal Chaf. Thank you, everybody that joined. It's really, really an incredible.